Range anxiety is one of the biggest things holding back EV adoption. Having easy access to fast charging alleviates that fear, but I also hear from people concerned that everyone charging EVs all at once will kill the grid. Will it? Let's take a closer look at EV fast charging, the competing standards, and what it means for the future of our grid. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Now, I've worked from home the entire time I've owned my Model 3, so I don't have a heavy daily commute anymore. Most of the times I'm using my car are for road trips driving around the Northeast of the United States. I've driven from the Boston area to Rochester, New York quite a few times to visit family in my car so far, which is about a 400 mile drive one way. I also make trips down to New York City to visit my brother from time to time, which is about a 200 mile drive. I've gotten used to making the 15 to 20 minute stops to grab some food, stretch my legs, and charge up the car on those trips. In the end, the total length of the trip isn't that different from a gasoline car, but it all comes down to the fact that I drive a Tesla Model 3 which can charge up to 150 kilowatts at V2 superchargers. So 20 minutes can mean a battery going from 20% to 80% capacity. And that goes up to 250 kilowatts at the newer V3 superchargers, so it's even faster there. But for those newer to EVs, there's a lot of confusion around charging formats and speeds. Where you can and can't charge, how long it takes, and why. Heck, there's even confusion for people who already own EVs. Probably the most confusing thing about getting an EV is the charging standards. It's a little bit of the Wild West when it comes to the connector types and the charging speeds. When you buy a gasoline car, you don't have to think about the type of nozzle that a gas station uses. They're all the same. The only thing you have to know is if it's regular versus diesel gasoline. With EVs, you've got things like J1772, CCS1, Type 2, CCS2, Chatamo, GBT, and Tesla's proprietary plug. This would be like Shell using a completely different nozzle on their gas pumps than those used by BP or Mobil. To add to the overall confusion, we also have three different levels of charging stations, which ultimately equates to how quickly they can charge your car. Here's how that breaks down. Level one charging stations. Level one uses standard 120 volt connections, which is the same as a standard household outlet. The plugs that come with an EV are typically meant for level one or level two charging but there's an important thing to understand. While most of us refer to these as chargers, they're actually not. They're really just glorified extension cords. The charger that converts AC power into DC for the battery is actually on board the car. Level one plugs work, but they can be very slow. When I visit my parents in the Rochester area, they let me plug into an outlet in their garage. I typically see three to four miles added to the car each hour. You can expect somewhere between 1.5 and two kilowatts per hour. If you're only using your car for daily commuting, you can probably get away with this type of setup since you'll most likely be charging overnight. But this is obviously not for on-the-go charging or someone who drives over 30 to 40 miles per day. The type of nozzle depends on where you live in the world. In Japan and the Americas, we have the J1772 plug. China has GBT and Europe is using the type two plug. Level two charging stations. Level two is also using AC power, but at a much higher output, like a 240 volt power source. Something like you typically see for an oven or a dryer. Just like level one, the car is still doing the AC to DC conversion, which is the limiter for how fast the charge will ultimately be. This is the route I went with my model three. I had a 240 volt 80 amp circuit put in and installed a Tesla wall connector in my garage. Now, even though I have an 80 amp circuit, the wall connector and the Model 3's onboard charger max out at 48 amps. While it's much faster than level one, it's still not fast enough for on-the-go charging. That's why these are often referred to as destination chargers. I can charge my Tesla up in a few hours and typically see rates that equate to about 40 to 45 miles added every hour. Level two chargers usually deliver around 10 to 20 kilowatts per hour. You'll find level two chargers all over the place at hotels, shopping malls, and grocery stores. They're great for topping off your car while shopping or charging for a few hours overnight. Level three charging stations. Level three is where things get interesting. These charging stations tend to be pretty large and offboard the AC to DC conversion from the car. They're capable of much higher energy throughput than your car's onboard charger. That means the power being delivered through the cable and the connector is already direct current the car can dump the incoming power straight into the battery pack. 
The fastest DC charging stations out there today have a max output of about 350 to 400 kilowatts. But there aren't any cars available today that can take advantage of that. Yet. The fastest cars today charge around 250 to 270 kilowatts max, like the Tesla Model 3 or the Porsche Taycan. It's also these level 3 chargers that typically have different requirements for plugs. You can't use the J1772 to deliver DC current into the car. It's only good for AC power delivery. So in the Americas, we've landed on the CCS1, which stands for Combined Charging Standard. It takes the J1772 plug and adds two additional DC connectors to the bottom. This means that you can have one port on your car that can accept a J1772 by itself or the full CCS1 plug for fast charging. China's GBT plug is also capable of DC charging. In Japan, they're using Chatamo for fast charging. And this is used in some areas still, but seems to be falling out of favor for CCS1 and CCS2 outside of Japan. In Europe and everywhere else, they have CCS2, which takes the Type 2 plug and adds an additional DC connector. It's the same approach as CCS1. And then there's Tesla, which has their own proprietary plug standard. The one small plug is capable of handling everything from level 1 to level 3. The only difference you'll see is that the supercharger cables are much thicker than the wall connector. The Tesla connector is both a good and a bad thing. The single plug makes it easy for Tesla owners, but requires a plug adapter to use non-Tesla chargers. And it means that non-Tesla cars can't use the Tesla chargers without an adapter either. In fact, no non-Tesla vehicles can use superchargers yet. Tesla had to add CCS2 ports to Tesla's sold in the EU, as well as to their superchargers. I'm not sure we'll see a similar requirement here in the US, but I'd love to see some kind of standardization here as well with Tesla and other EVs. The simpler we can make it, the better. I kind of look at it like Apple with the lightning port on iPhones. It'd be great if they would just make the switch to USB-C like everybody else. But as a company, I understand why they don't want to do that quite yet. It's the level three charging stations that are the key to long road trips. And this is an area that Tesla has a commanding lead over the competition with the supercharger network. Around the world, the supercharger network currently has about 1,870 stations with 16,585 superchargers. The V2 superchargers max out at 150 kilowatts, but the newer V3 superchargers that they're rolling out now charge up to 250 kilowatts. In Europe, you have companies like Ionity and Fastned building out fast charging networks. In the US, you have EVgo with fast chargers that are mostly around 50 kilowatts and Electrify America installing 350 kilowatt charging stations. While none of these have the distribution of the supercharger network yet, they're working fast to try to catch up. That covers the basics for the most common chargers and connectors in use today. But the underlying question of how this will impact the grid is a little tougher to answer. One of the arguments against EVs is that the more power hungry level two and three chargers put a big strain on the grid. And if everyone was having to plug their cars in to charge, it would bring everything down. Now in theory, it seems like a valid concern, but it's a lot more complicated than that. In 2019, EVs made up about 2.2% of car sales in the US, and about 2.5% worldwide. One projection has EV sales hitting 10 to 12.5% by 2025, and getting to 50% of sales sometime around 2035 to 2040. The Boston Consulting Group also puts EV adoption hitting 50% sometime in the 2030s. The rate of adoption is important because it gives utilities time to upgrade and grow with the adoption curve of EVs. If companies are able to incentivize charging patterns, like giving discounted rates to charge overnight instead of during the day, it can help distribute charging to off-peak times. Utilities would be able to reduce the amount of grid upgrades required because they're redistributing the demand. In the Boston Consulting Group's modeling, they showed that the optimized charging patterns would reduce transmission and distribution costs by 70% per EV through 2030. So what happens if they can't shift demand with incentives? The same study showed that there could be a big spike in electricity costs in order to cover the grid upgrades. If utilities are successful, electricity price increases could be kept down to about 3 to 5 cents per kilowatt hour, which is essentially unchanged. However, if utilities don't take the proper measures, like the discounted rates for overnight charging, you could be looking at a 2% rate increase. Many utilities are already rolling out EV incentives to get ahead of this. Here in Massachusetts, my utility is Eversource, and they have a program called Connected Solutions, which incentivizes installing a smart charger in your home. It's essentially a smart home technology that allows them to control the charging speed and times in order to balance the grid usage. I actually participated in this program with my smart thermostat last summer, which worked really well. 
From my perspective, I didn't notice much of a change, but it helped to spread the load on the grid. But it's not all up to the utilities themselves. Companies are introducing products to help manage the load as well. NLX recently announced a new line of chargers that all integrate behind the scenes. Whether it's home wall plugs or public chargers, they communicate on a network called JuiceNet, which can dynamically optimize the state of charge, energy consumption, and the needs of the grid in real time. Blink has introduced wall plugs that also have load management built in. These are designed with multifamily buildings in mind because you can install up to 20 of them off of a single phase AC circuit. They share the available power between all of the plugged in EVs. This reduces overload and installation costs. And finally, there are systems like Wallbox's Quasar Bidirectional Charger. Not only can you charge your car, but you can use your car to power your home when it's needed. Vehicle to grid systems can also benefit utilities because they could siphon off small amounts of power from your car during peak load times, and then they replenish that energy along with paying you for what they used. Fast chargers, which require incredible throughput, also have some interesting solutions in the works. Some companies like Envision Solar and FastNed are rolling out charging stations powered by solar and wind power. Combining battery storage with EV charging stations can also have a major impact. The stations can either store renewable energy generation from those solar panels, or the batteries can trickle charge from the grid at a lower rate and at off-peak times. The batteries provide the high power bursts that are needed while charging cars instead of having to do it from the grid. VW actually just introduced its first charging station with built-in battery in January, and EVgo has installed 14 battery storage systems so far to help balance demand. Are there challenges and costs to upgrading the grid to handle EV adoption? Of course, but they're not insurmountable and not guaranteed to drive electricity costs through the roof. We're already seeing utilities and companies introducing solutions to balance load and keep costs down. And we all need to remember that it's gonna take time for EVs to reach a level that might cause some problems for the grid. As EV adoption ramps up, so will the changes to our grid and charging infrastructure. We didn't have gasoline stations on every corner and an infrastructure to support internal combustion engine cars on day one either. This will be no different. Where some see roadblocks, others see opportunities. There are a lot of smart people and companies finding solutions to all of this. And I'm really excited to see where it goes. And speaking of companies that see opportunities instead of roadblocks, check out my Tesla Explained video. They have a lot more in common with a Silicon Valley tech company than a car company. It's part of why they're so disruptive. Now jump into the comments and let me know what you think. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.